the 911. Where is your emergency? Hi, uh, yes, my fiance just there is a gentleman passed out on the Heroin second floor. is so addictive. And he passed out in their room. So dangerous. What did he take? So deadly. Um, it's heroin. It has become one of the worst drug epidemics in Virginia history. How old is the patient? Heroin doesn't care what background you have or where he came from. 34, 35. Yeah, I don't think he's breathing. Heroin doesn't care what your skin color is, how smart you are. He took what? How old you are, whether you're male or female. Heroin and Xanax. Now I approach this moment, this coldness takes over, takes control to cope and it's dormant. Heroin overdose deaths in Virginia nearly doubled from 2011 to 2013. Every region has experienced an increase in heroin fatality. The sickness is too much for me to handle. My stomach is doing flips. Including a 164% increase in Northern Virginia, a 94% increase in Hampton Roads, and a 50% increase in the Richmond metro area. Jamal Davis is a homicide detective with the yes. Norfolk Police. His background in narcotics investigation showed him a lot about the dangers of drugs, but heroin comes across his desk more than ever in death investigations. When I first started back 16 years ago in narcotics, it was mainly cocaine and crack. Actually, let me come listen to some of that. But play today's that. heroin user is often quite different from the addict of years past. Uh, just play one of them. Far from street smart junkie stereotypes, users are likely to come to heroin on a much more innocent path. One that begins in a doctor's office, where strong medications called opiates are prescribed to relieve pain after a surgery or injury. You get clean and now you're finding out. Dr. James Thompson is a board certified addiction medicine specialist and medical director of Clean Life Medical in Richmond. Because addiction is a, is a lethal disease. People die from it all the time. You meet some people who say they don't like the feeling of having opiates. Others like it, but um, there's a downside to it and only need to use it when they're in pain. But there will always be a certain percentage who are deeply impressed by the good feeling that opiates give them. Those people, if they're not careful, may find themselves pursuing that feeling. And then what happens is they become addicted, and then if they end up not being able to get that medication, they'll turn to heroin, which is a cheaper form of the same type of substance. Evan Barlow began experimenting with opiates in his teens, becoming completely addicted from age 16 to 20. Eventually, pills weren't enough and uh, I eventually found heroin, then I eventually found the needle, which was my downfall. So Jamie doesn't want to come over here? Hannah Newsom's life was all late nights and parties when she began to abuse prescription pain pills. When those became harder to get, her friends began using heroin instead. First, I was like, huh, no. There is no way in the world that I'm gonna do that. And eventually, you know, pills weren't around and I was sick. So I tried it. I was maybe like 85 pounds, 90 pounds. My body was shutting down. I was sick all the time. No matter how much hair when I did, I was still sick. And then that was the start of the end. My son is a heroin addict and he is falling out and I can't wake him up and I don't know what's wrong with him. As demand increases, some dealers may add other substances to make the heroin more appealing to users. One such substance is fentanyl, a powerful painkiller often prescribed to cancer patients. The intent is to create a more intense high, but it often leads instead to abrupt death. I can't feel anything. He's not breathing? I can't feel anything coming out of his nose. And fentanyl is a very strong painkiller, so it kind of like slows your heartbeat and you're breathing down to almost nothing. With that on top of the heroin, people just expire because they just, their heart stop beating and their lungs <laughs> stop functioning. And in Richmond, for example, the heroin was mixed with a horse tranquilizer. So heroin alone is deadly, but when you mix it with a substance like fentanyl, a painkiller, you don't, you don't stand a chance. Uh, some overdoses, if their friends and family react quick enough, they can be saved. But a lot of them, with the fentanyl cases, we're finding that 
even with quick reaction, they're still passing away. I think my friend just overdosed on, on heroin. He's unconscious? Yeah. Still, despite warnings and news stories about the presence of dangerous additives, addicts in search of a bigger high are still willing to take the risk. And unfortunately on the streets, if you have a, a heroin out there that overdoses and kills somebody, for some strange reason, more people want it. People will be shocked by someone who dies of an overdose when I just see it and I keep, and I'm like, well, it's, it happened again, like, because it happens all the time. Users who somehow avoid a fatal overdose are lucky not to face death, but they say what they're left with isn't much of a life. I wasn't really living at all. I was dead inside. I was just a, walking around getting high every day. I had no purpose. I had no place on this planet to be anything. I was just a, a shell, and I would just use every day. As their use of the drug increases, many don't realize the gravity of the situation until they begin to suffer the consequences of their dependency on the substance. In other words, getting in trouble with the law, beginning to violate their own moral code, having to tell lies, having to hide their problem, having to steal from uh, and deceive the, the people that they care about. Everything in my life revolved around it. I didn't care about anything else. I, I stole from my family, from my friends, from stores, from Anybody that had anything that the dope man would trade me for drugs. With desperate users resorting to theft to pay for their habit, and ruthless sellers often using violence and gang activity to protect their profits, the heroin problem affects everyone in the Commonwealth. And so we have an epidemic, and the epidemic has led to a lot of people whose lives have been ruined and to a lot of people who have died. Too many Virginians are losing their loved ones to heroin and prescription drug overdoses. I don't want to see another parent bury a child or another child to lose a parent to these dangerous drugs. The problem is particularly evident in Hampton Roads where the region's coastal location makes it particularly appealing to traffickers. It's centralized. You can get drugs coming in from the ports, coming from Miami, and people from New York, people from our West Kentucky, West Virginia, would come here to meet. And we're on the Intercoastal Waterway, which goes from New York to Florida, and a lot of drug drop-offs are done at various spots throughout the ports. And while a lot of that product is merely changing hands for distribution elsewhere, it is also contributing to a growing drug problem in Hampton Roads. This heroin epidemic, just in this book alone, for the, the cases I've worked over the last few years, we're almost to more than 50 deaths that I investigated myself. Just all the heroin. The surge in heroin deaths caught the attention of the Virginia Attorney General's office setting off an intense investigation in the region. Prescription drug abuse often leads to a path of addiction and to the cheap and potent heroin that we're seeing on the streets today. The deaths aren't limited to hardened, long-time drug users living in drug houses or back alleys. You wouldn't imagine the areas that you get these drug overdoses at um, because they're not your typical ghetto, for example, neighborhood, or your project complex neighborhood. White females, black males, black females, uh, Hispanics, it, it does not, whether you're rich, poor, or anything, it has no discrimination. This heroin, fentanyl uh, epidemic is, is devastating all across the board. I will never forget hearing a story from a woman I met coming off the public safety tour we did. She met me and she said she was so glad she got a chance to talk to me. And she told me that just a month earlier, she and her husband lost their daughter. She was gonna get well and be the mom that she knew she could be because she, um, she, hated, who the, she hated the person who she'd become because it wasn't her. Caitlin Weems of Virginia Beach was outgoing, fun, and had a wide circle of friends, 
a competitive soccer player throughout middle and high school, she was certainly not predicted to become a heroin addict. Caitlin was just a fun-loving girl. She liked to go out and smile and play sports, and she was really good at interacting and getting to know anybody and everybody. She was very protective of the siblings and our family. Um, if someone would mess with any of us, she would go right to them and take care of it. Probably one of the best players that I have ever coached. Uh, I can really uh, honestly say that. I've been doing this for over 20 years. Just really pleasant, great sense of humor. Uh, just, you know, just a, a joy to be around. Just uh, loved her like a daughter. After years of dedication to the sport, she developed a painful disc problem in her back. Then, in her freshman year of high school, she suffered a serious dental injury during the playoffs. They wired her three teeth back in, but that, um, led to nine root canals after that and more pain, which led to more pain medicine. The following year was a blur of dental surgeries and procedures, a time when Caitlin's mother says her time away from school led to loneliness. Looking back, that may have pushed her medication habit from therapeutic to problematic. So I think that soon she got um, her tolerance, you know, increased and then it just wasn't working. So I would think that, you know, by 11th grade that she was dependent on it. Caitlin kept her habit well hidden and eagerly went back to playing soccer. This is at one of Conley's soccer games. She was recruited to play at a Pennsylvania college, but her college career had hardly yeah. begun when she met a young man who was also abusing prescription drugs. So on her 12th day of college, she called me and said that she was leaving college and going to live with this boy out of state. And then that's when, I didn't know at the time, but a few months later, she was heavily addicted. Now in Georgia, Caitlin was no longer getting her pills from doctor visits. She was buying everything from dealers and taking whatever she could get for her family. The problem was now clear. Several times I flew down there and begged her to come home. Her siblings begged her to come home to get help. And um, she came home probably about six or seven times, but always went back. Things started looking up when Caitlin found a new reason to get well. She was pregnant and she wanted to come home to have the baby. Her family welcomed the idea, saying Caitlin could come home as long as she stuck to some strict ground rules. So she agreed to that and she stayed completely clean for 15 months and delivered the most beautiful, healthy baby. Things went well until the baby was a few months old. Caitlin relapsed and the following months were a series of rehab visits, good days and bad days with no lasting success. We as a family had to say, you know, you're welcome to stay here as long as you're clean and sober, but if you're using drugs, you're not, you're not going to be able to stay here. So um, she actually moved out. One day, Caitlin called to ask her mother if they could meet to talk. She needed to confess that since leaving home, her problem had reached a new level. She had moved on to heroin. She said she had tried it that somebody had told her that it's as good as pain medicine, it's basically the same thing. And um, so she said, so I need help because I can tell this drug is strong. Again, Caitlin was off to rehab, but this time she agreed to move into a sober living facility afterward, something she had never agreed to before. And she asked them to um, drug test her more often than usual because she was going to stay clean this time and she wanted to show her parents and the judge that she was um, good to be a full-time mom now. One night, she called home with some relatively minor troubles on her mind. Her mother told her to get a good night's sleep. She would see her the next day. And that was like a five-minute you know, conversation. and. It was fine and I was ready to pick her up the next day. In the morning, Caitlin was nowhere to be found, but her roommates discovered that the bathroom door was locked. So we got a screwdriver and I unscrewed, like I unscrewed the doorknob, took the doorknob off and I looked in the door and that's when I saw her arm laying there 
blue. So at that point, we got a hammer and we all just started busting the door down. At that point, you didn't know what you were gonna walk into. Um, so I walked in and there she was against the wall. She was dead already. Detectives went to her parents' home to deliver the terrible news. Just as Carolyn was gathering her things to go visit Caitlin. From the moment that doorbell rang, I became a totally different person. This is where she last um, stayed, and I did a redo. The way I look, look, the way I look at things is so different now. Um, the replaying of everything, um, it just changes your life in an instant. And, um, you know, people said, you know, you have to get back to your, your normal, find a new normal. There's nothing normal about bearing your child. It was, it was, I can't even explain how that felt. <laughs> it was very hard. I, I, I see it every day, every day. I, I can picture it. But at the same time, it reminds me to stay clean. I miss listening to music with her and singing with her and her doing my hair and going to the beach and if it would have happened like a year earlier, I maybe I you know, of course would have been as devastated but not as surprised. But the fact that she was doing so well, it really, really shocked us. Yeah. And um, she thought she'd beat it, but the drug was just too strong. And it's it's powerful stuff. So um I just want people to know that they've got to act quickly and they've got to act pretty aggressively and we've got to be able to offer some true rehabilitation and some true education. And um, so I just hope that somebody can learn from Caitlin. This is Caitlin for you. Have a good day and we'll see you wait, in a little wait. bit. Stephen grew up richer than the rest, cut from different cloths, silk draped across his chest. But as the boy grew up, he started acting up. Pretty soon he's scheming to rob his mom and stuff. Yeah, addiction is a, uh, is a prevalent but often misunderstood problem. He's a big boy now, but he's got a little temper. And in the addiction field, we consider it a disease. He went down to the corner with his clothes all in a hamper, pawned his Gucci and his Louis to stay up all night with Molly. But his man had other plans, and here was Stephen's folly. I like to think of it personally a lot like other mental illnesses, um, mood disorders like depression that can be severe. He tried the dope and called his man back. Yo, this feels great. Can I come back? He said, of course, brother, you can. As long as you, you put, put a hundred in, in my hand. hand. The addict is a person who may be you know, very intelligent, very capable, a very good person. So Stephen started plotting how to get high. It was awesome. Perhaps has made some poor choices in life, uh, and who hasn't? Knock, knock, knock on wooden door. Dude opened up. I'm here for more. Held his hand out like a beggar. Got his drugs, his secret pleasure. Oftentimes, it's not recognized until the patient is beginning to suffer consequences of his or her dependence on a drug. Stephen drove around the block and parked, pulled out his spoon, broke off a rock, pulled the rig out of his sock, pulled back some units. But then Stephen remembered, he had no cotton, he lost his temper. He thought about it for a sec, pulled up the stew and looked around, and then he shot up in the clouds. 911, where's your emergency? My son is dead in the bathroom. Okay, this is the city of Winchester. As you can see, it's a wonderful place to work and play. But if we've got a problem with heroin in a place like this, you can imagine what's happening in other parts of the state in other parts of the country. Across the state in Winchester, a similar problem has been unfolding. A number of major highways, including Interstate 81, converge in this area. 
Police Chief Kevin Sanzenbacher says that like Hampton Roads, Winchester is seeing the downside of its easily accessible location. Baltimore seems to be a, um, an entry point for the heroin trade because you know, not only does it have a port, uh, but it also has close proximity along 95 to Washington, Philadelphia, uh, New York. Winchester's abundance of highways mean that it's not only easy to get heroin into the city, but it's also a central location of distributing the product further south. They're going up, uh, they're buying from any street dealer they can find on the streets, and then they're coming down and they're hitting, you know, what we call the Arrow Corridor. As they did in Hampton Road, petty crimes have risen in these areas as users struggle to finance their habits. The big thing that you see is people stealing jewelry to go and pawn. I've talked to victims where they've had jewelry that's been in their family for years. It's a family heirloom. It gets pawned at a pawn shop for $50 so somebody can go and score heroin. Lauren Hannon was 23 years old when the unpredictable nature of heroin caught up with her. Described as a bright and highly motivated young woman, Lauren had plans for college and hoped to own a restaurant someday. She was very loving, very positive, optimistic. She was the person that you could always go to if you needed something. Very happy, outgoing. She laughed a lot. Look at me and her and the boys. At the her mother, Denise, says Lauren was a great student. See how much they grew from there to there? Mm -hmm. Graduating from high school early because she was eager to get into the workforce. But around age 20, a few months after the birth of her son, Lauren suddenly seemed different. Itch in her nose, her eyes were red. She wouldn't, her pupils were really small. She wouldn't look at me directly in the face and talk to me. Denise says she recognized these signs of drug use from dealing with an addict in a relationship many years before. And I knew exactly what it was because of what I had seen with him. And I was terrified. Denise confronted Lauren, who denied any drug use and tried to explain away the signs her mother was seeing. But the next morning, she came to Denise with a confession. She was using heroin. She said it was the third time she had used it, but that it was not nowhere near going to be a problem for her because it, she had too much going on in her life to let that take her down. Over the coming months, Lauren moved out of her mother's house and continued to use. But Denise said it seemed to be only occasionally. It's only like once a month I would notice it, or maybe twice in one month. And then finally, after four months um, of that, I told her I would turn her in and take her child, and she's just stopped. She immediately stopped. Lauren severed ties with the friends she'd been using with, got a new job, and became her usual happy, motivated self again. She made plans to start college and surrounded herself with good friends. It looked like her heroin days were really behind her, and their strong mother-daughter bond was back. We laughed. We really, really, we laughed. laughed. Then, almost two years later, Denise started seeing those same old signs in her daughter, and she realized that one of Lauren's old friends had come to visit her. So I knew for a fact that she had used, because um, she never went looking for it that had to come to her. Denise tried to call Lauren and confront her, but after multiple attempts, could not get an answer. No answer, no answer. I got scared. And I just kept calling her phone and calling her phone and calling her phone. And finally, the police answered it. It says 911. Do you have an emergency? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my roommate uh, is not breathing. Because I knew. And they told me that she had overdosed, and I asked them, was she alive? said there was a pulse. Her eyes look dilated, her lips are blue. She's not breathing, what do I do? It was Lauren's roommate who found her. After hearing her phone ring repeatedly, he went into her room to wake her from a nap. What's her name, sir? Her name is Lauren. Lauren what? Hannon. And he turned her over and she was blue. 
she was taking a nap right beside her son. Is she waking up? No, ma'am, she's not. Okay. Lauren was taken to the hospital still clinging to life, but the hope for her survival was slim. No, ma'am, I don't feel or hear anything. They took me to a room and showed me her brain scan and told me right then and there to start planning her funeral. To lose a friend in general is devastating, but losing someone to a drug, to heroin especially, it takes the breath out of you. I miss her. I miss her very much. How can such a beautiful person go? Detective Andrew Perlick was one of the investigators at the scene of Lauren's overdose. He says the contrast between the life she lived and the way she died highlights one of the difficulties of heroin use. Well, a lot of people that were present at the hospital, they were unaware that Lauren had any issues with any substance abuse. So I think it shows that it was very secretive. Secrecy means that the full extent of a user's problem may not be known until it's too late. So the stigma and shame associated with heroin may be as dangerous as the drug itself. So we have to develop more of a rapport and express more of a concern and an understanding of where these people are coming from. Phil Figura is chief prosecutor with the Major Crimes and Emerging Threats Unit of the Attorney General's Office. He says Winchester's location has made the drug more accessible to rural communities too. But there's no bigger problem than a newborn that is brought into a delivery room with an addicted mother and the baby is currently addicted to heroin and they have to deal with that in hospitals and it's a tragedy. Local hospitals began seeing a rise in heroin-exposed babies around 2010. Perinatal nurse case manager Maria Dalala says the mothers are usually addicted long before pregnancy. I've been talking to, um, to mom about some of the follow-up. And that the drug sometimes leads them to unprotected encounters. Then all of a sudden they find themselves pregnant. And at that point, they truly can't wean themselves off of medications or um, illicit drugs in order to, to protect the baby. The long-term effects of opiates aren't clear, but in the short term, babies born addicted seem to suffer quite a bit when the withdrawal symptoms begin. Usually a baby will, um, will show signs of of jitteriness, they might have generalized tremors, they get really stiff, their, their arms and legs get really stiff, they might have um, inconsolable crying that just goes on and on. With even newborns suffering the consequences of heroin addiction, it's clear that no segment of society is sheltered from its potential for harm. It needs to be looked at as a, as a public health crisis um, and approached through a healing process and, and seeking recovery for individuals with addiction uh, and putting resources in place that are, are bridges towards um, uh, recovery and healing and hope. Hey little man, how about if you and I talk? The eyes inside the devil also wimp the windshield. I look into them, want to be like him. I just want to be with him. Grew up never listening to parental advice. I grew up listening to needles and pipes. Sleep with demons at night. Inside of my mind, I mock myself like I will never be as good as my kin, as good as my friends at anything in my life. So, what is the point of living if confidence is non existent? What is the point if happiness is always far and distant? It seems an addict mind is cursed with self esteem issues. Helpless fiend, he sold his dreams for some demons and a bag of tissues. To wipe away the tears so mama won't cry. Cause when she saw me crying, she'd always break down inside. But now it's too late. Cause mama gone to heaven from the heartbreak due to Evan. Turned a life into a lesson. 
And the lesson was this, no she died so I could live on And prosper in this world while I let her spirit live on I got it cause this sickness that I got telling me that I won't amount to nothing Always takes a hold of me even when I amount to something It'll bring me down again, stomp me on the ground again Roses only live for so long, once you clip the stem of them It's not much left to live so hold the moment close and own it now Before it goes away like roses in the wind No pun intended, you made your point, I get it God I'm present I'm here to hear the message, let me listen You're so sweet. You're oh, such a sweet little fella. Healing and hope are what addicts find in recovery at places like the McShin Foundation in Richmond. So, we're talk, we're but talk the about first it. step usually comes after the addict's worst moments. When we come in and we're beat up and our self esteem is down here, and we're well, nobody initiates recovery on a winning streak. Nobody finds McShin because their life is going great. And they're, and they're doing these things. Something goes wrong. Something bad happens. You, you'll hear people refer to, to bottoms. Um, I try not to use the word bottom because really, you know, you, you, can, you, can, dig, you can always dig a little further. This is actually the house that I overdosed in, and I just moved right back into it. Throughout this whole process, it was um, embezzling money. When you look into the mirror, um, stealing money from my parents. What are some of the things that come to mind when you look into the mirror? Stealing money from my grandparents, pawning everything that I own. It's like a, it's like a black hole where it, you just become this like negative energy floating around. You suck up any negative energy around you. You're attracting the worst kinds of people. You're doing the worst kinds of things. Years and years of just trauma and, and disgust and the things that I did to the people closest to me. Stealing and, and begging for money and lying. I mean, my name is Honesty, and I did not live up to that for 14 years of my life for sure. And I overdosed. Um, a couple other roommates found me. Completely ash gray, blue lips, no pulse, not breathing. They um, gave me CPR until EMT um, arrived. They hit me with Narcan twice. And I overdosed. Uh, my mom found me in my room. So I was pretty much dead. I was in a coma for four days. And they brought me out of the coma and here I am. It's important to, to recognize that you know everything in moderation. Um, you can't just do one thing all the time. When I was 17, I overdosed on heroin. Hello? Hello? What is going on? You know, no one in the house wanted to call 911. These are stories they told me after the fact because I was dead. They were dragging me from room to room. I was purple. I really wasn't. I was doing that death rattle where you, you know, I was like, and stuff like that. A heroin overdose happens when an addict brings too much drug into their system all at once. So they didn't want to call 911 because half of them were on probation. There was drugs and alcohol in the house. A lot of them are underage. Yeah, I was at the flyer is all I have of who's coming, the speakers that are coming. Though she'll never forget coming to the foundation for the help that changed her life, Honesty Liller is now its CEO. What is so awesome about this organization, it's peer-to-peer 24-7, -peer so you're not just going to a therapy session or a group or anything for an hour, it's 24-7 here. I have a great relationship with my family, uh, my friends, I have a girlfriend, uh, so everything, everything comes back, but there's a lot of work that goes into it. It's important to stay humble, so whatever you achieve in life, the more humble you are, the easier it is. You don't have to deal with criticism, you don't have to deal with people hating on you. I'm very involved in my recovery. I still live in a woman's recovery house helping the newcomers. Everything happens for a reason. That could happen because something else better is coming along your way. And I've seen people from all types of cultural backgrounds, you know, 
socioeconomic backgrounds, everybody with different backgrounds has the, has the opportunity to recover. This is a list of those we've lost, people that we've known. So how do we help the Commonwealth itself recover from this epidemic with diligent law enforcement? After discussion, uh, we decided that we were not able to deal with it just from a law enforcement perspective. We really needed some community assistance uh, and that we were not going to be able to arrest our way out of the situation. Aggressive prosecution of dealers and compassionate health care. From my perspective, um, we have a moral responsibility as a health care organization to address a big health challenge in our community, which in this case is addiction. There is already a light at the end of the tunnel. And Virginia lawmakers have made additional solutions a bipartisan priority. And we've also felt that we have some good ideas. Many of you are working every single day with folks who are struggling with addiction. This includes expansion of naloxone, a drug that reverses the effects of an overdose. A Good Samaritan bill, so people who call for help during an overdose won't risk getting in trouble. And a prescription monitoring program to make sure that people aren't getting drugs they're not allowed to have. Making naloxone more widely available is life-saving because it acts as an immediate antidote to the deadly effects of an overdose. And the effect of the opiate, the heroin, will completely cease immediately. And the patient will go into withdrawal uh, immediately, but they will also, they'll wake up, they'll start breathing, and their life can be saved. This requires a timely response in the critical minutes after an overdose. Eastern Alawan, where's your emergency? An opportunity sometimes missed when friends and bystanders are too frightened to do anything. Sometimes people are afraid to call 911. Um, a lot of times young people who are new to this heroin habit become worried about the trouble that they will get in if they bring attention to the person who's possibly overdosing. This has led to victims being dumped outside of emergency rooms or abandoned entirely, which greatly reduces their chances of survival. Please, you know, call 911. Uh, you have time. Um, overdose takes a little bit of time to develop. And um, as breathing slows, it becomes more and more critical. Even with a coordinated, focused response to this epidemic, the most important part of the solution is in prevention. As parents, we all want the very best for our kids. Pain medication should be kept in a safe place away from your kids. Just because a doctor prescribed a drug doesn't mean it's safe. Your kids should always come to you before taking any prescription drug. Having an open and honest conversation can make all the difference. Look at it. I can see the footprints on the tracks that you run around. Always been a runner up after the first time you started coming down. Found a needle in a haystack, turned you into a champion. I shouldn't feel this old, I'm 32. Now you lost in a chase in a race, now there can't be one. And I can see the teardrops. Hate it. On your faces, they coming down. Dripping on the tracks, on the tracks, on the tracks, on the tracks that you run around. And I can see the blood, sweat, veins bursting at the seams. Spinning paper by the ream on a dream, on a dream, on a dream, on a dream. And I can see the closed door. The rooms where you with your trainers who cheer you on while the ones you love don't even return calls out of anger. Find it hard to sleep, but you on the night made your own heaven set of waiting on a Godhead. Start on every lap, but still showing up last. The only thing waiting at the finish line is your past. Skipping all the hurdles, spending dollars and cents for a long distance run, but all you got is a sprint. I see the miles on your arms, the miles in your eyes. The miles start to swarm, use your sleeves as disguise. As the miles start to build, you get slow in your pace. That gun might only sound at the end of your race. I think I'm dying. I think I'm dying. 
pit and my stomach's hurting constantly. Coughing and blood. I feel ever so sick. I've been passing blood from just about every orifice you can imagine. Really not very well. Really not well. So if this is my task, then please Lord, please forgive me for my sins. I've never been a bad person and I never meant to be. Parents need to know how dangerous um, these painkillers are and what a slippery slope their child or their young adult or their spouse or their co-worker is on because it's so easy to transition into heroin because it's the same thing, just in a different form, made, made in a different place. And I think, you know, people say, why are you doing this? And, and I say, I don't want anybody to go through what our family's gone through. You hear the voice inside you saying you'll never be good enough And no matter how hard you try you can't seem to rise above So you think about giving up cause everything's wrong But your heart keeps saying just be Ninety-five percent of people who go to jail will eventually return to the community. Let's face it, the system isn't built to provide a smooth transition back into society and ex-offenders face significant challenges in reintegrating after incarceration. Finding employment, paying for housing, and regaining trust with family and neighbors are constant struggles for ex-offenders. If we don't address these very real challenges, the cycle of crime is likely to continue. So what do we do? Well, OAR Fairfax offers opportunities, alternatives, and resources to ex-offenders and their families. They're trying to break the cycle and make our community better. OAR is where the rubber meets the road. Do something to help someone today. Visit oarfairfax.org. Donate, volunteer, and find a way to help someone in your community today. Alzheimer's is not just a problem for the person with disease. It's a problem for the caregiver also. We had been on a long journey of 
18 months or more trying to figure out what was going on with my husband. No diagnosis. Do a test, come back in a few months, and finally we had a name to put on this disease. I waited three weeks, we waited three weeks to get an appointment there. Just the day that we were, I got her out of bed and I got her ready to go, I received a phone call saying, please don't come, the doctor doesn't want to see you. Well, it turned out that the reason that he panicked was that he had seen the notes from her psychiatrist in New York who said that, uh, that it, it might be possible Lewy body dementia. And he said, I don't know anything about Lewy body dementia. I don't want to see this woman. So I began to research as much as I could find out and try to sort out reliable web information because the doctor really didn't tell me a lot. He couldn't remember how to get places he'd always been getting overexcited about losing things. Something was just wrong. So I got him to a neurologist. He had all these evaluations done. In 2006, we were given the diagnosis of early dementia. I was in this alone, and I knew what the future of Alzheimer's would be. It was such a welcome relief when I came to the first meeting. But I will say it was scary as well because most of the people at that first meeting had had a diagnosis for quite a bit longer and their loved ones were farther along on this journey. They had many more symptoms than my husband showed at the time. So that was a big eye opener. And I found out that this group was so, so helpful. Um, it wasn't just a matter of helping with suggestions about how to solve this problem, how to solve it. It's how you deal, how you yourself can deal with these things. It gives me a place to talk about what's going on, to ask, to share information, because some of the people that are further down this road than I am have learned things. Um, one of the, and, and some of the speakers that you've brought in that are professionals in this field have been very, very helpful. Uh, I was told that caregivers are very important and if you're gonna if you're gonna continue to be able to help your wife you better take care of yourself. Um, I remember you brought in um, some physical and occupational therapists and speech therapists to talk about the kinds of therapies that apply to this disorder and my my Rich's di uh, doctor never suggested that so when I went to the next appointment I said how about if we get these services for him and he was glad to write the prescription, but he didn't volunteer it. And so it gave me questions to ask the doctor and made me better informed so I could ask the right things at the appointment. The support group is a lot more than just trying to help you cope with the problems of the person with the Alzheimer's. They're there to help you cope with your problems, which you tend to be view as not relevant, you're too busy worrying about the other person, so you put them up on the shelf. I will forever, ever, ever be thankful to that group for giving me the courage to just save myself. I, I listen, and quite frankly, I have learned a great deal here, from, especially from the women who, who have been dealing with their spouses and what they've been going through you know, I think, oh God, is that my future? And it, it very well could be. So I'm learning and it's preparing me uh, for what's coming up. Insight and Christy were there for me every step of the way from beginning to end. And they will be there for you too, if you ever need them. When Cornerstones was established in 1970, its founders recognized that even in a community where people are welcomed and are welcoming, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, or socioeconomic background, people could work hard and still not earn enough to support their families, that there would always be hungry people or people in crisis. Many in our community are just one unexpected life event away from living in their car or on a friend's couch or on the street. No one plans on being homeless. My life before, I was the owner of a uh, big pharmacy in Washington, D.C. 
In August of 2008, uh, 2010, I discovered an embezzlement of several million dollars. And by the summer of 2014, I have lost everything. The house and my business. We have had to leave the house in Great Falls. And in October 4th of 2014, we entered the Emory Riker Center. My first impression, um, it was a surprise. It was a pleasant surprise. The people were very, very nice. I got a nice welcome. And we got a nice room. And my biggest surprise was the food. It was a kitchen with four ladies cooking fresh food uh, three times a day. And my biggest pleasant surprise was my case manager. He provided a lot of love and psychological support. And he explained to me all the services that Cornerstone is uh, providing for the homeless people. Our comprehensive programs provide stability to people in times of crisis, resources that promote empowerment for moving forward and hope for the future. At Cornerstones, we meet people wherever they are without judgment. Now I have my home. Uh, my daughter, she's in school, she's very good. She's gonna go to university. My husband, good job working. Now I'm thinking to go to university, to finish my university, and to find good job after that. Providing stability is only the first step. Where Cornerstones is different from other organizations is in providing the gift of time and resources that continue after the immediate crisis has passed. Cornerstones empowers people to take the next step in what is often a longer journey to well-being through their own hard work and the tenacious support of Cornerstone staff, volunteers, and partners. And we see the difference that makes every day. I become a citizen and I enjoy the class and it's helped me also my English is become better and I speak uh, better now and I understand also people when they're talking and um, after that I interested and I help her in the class when I become citizen I still come every week and help in the class. When we got the place the Cornerstone has been extremely supportive to us. They furnished the house because I didn't have anything left. Um, new beds, tons of food, and any supply you can imagine. My case manager came here, brought cleaning things, sheets and clothes and food. So uh, the ladies came here, they fixed everything for us. So it was much, it was an easy and very pleasant transition from the shelter to this place. And I'm very appreciative. These individuals can imagine a future they thought out of reach and can begin to make goals for a better future. Goals we all share for ourselves and for our children. Goals that are possible with the support and partnership that you provide. Immediately when we moved to the community, we, we knew that Cornerstones was going to be an, an excellent uh, partner, build a strong relationship with us. We've been very involved with the organization, whether it's volunteering at the Embry Rucker Shelter, participating in the Help to Homeless Walks, uh, and just frankly helping to secure affordable housing for those individuals living in our community. It's such a critical need to build a better rest in. Cornerstones is proud of the role we play as a participant, convener, interconnector, and advocate, bringing people and sectors together to solve some of our region's most challenging problems. Our readiness program for job seekers has been adopted countywide, and with our business leaders, we're defining the skill sets needed for our current and future workforce. With Reston's Opportunity Neighborhood Initiative, Cornerstones is working along with our partners to see that all children thrive in a healthy start in life and are prepared to excel in school and career. And true to Cornerstones founders, we believe that our job is to end homelessness, not just manage it, by developing housing that is affordable for people over their entire lifetime. 
Together with our partners, we have reduced homelessness in Fairfax County by 47%. We remain firmly rooted in the Reston community goals handed down by its founder. We apply the value that all may live, work, play, and serve in the many areas which Cornerstones operates today. Cornerstone, it's, it's a very, very important organization. Based on my experience, is providing a tremendous help to needy people. And uh, I'm, I cannot express in words how appreciative I am for what uh, Cornerstone has provided for me and my son. And most, most of all is, besides, again, all the material things we get is, is the love and the attention we get from the case management. It's like, uh, I'm become like, now I'm doing things, I'm happy, yeah. Estaba bien mal. Y así fue como todo se fue dando bien rápido porque ella estaba bien mal de salud. Tenía fiebre, congestión, no podía respirar. Ella tenía una distrofia en los adenoides y las amígdalas. El doctor decía siempre que la llevaba a cualquier urgente que era la emergencia que necesitaba operación pero que necesitaba tener los recursos económicos para poder hacérsela. Aquí en este país la salud es bien cara y no todos tenemos acceso. La llevé a, varias, a varios doctores y todos me sugirieron que necesitaba la operación. Fue una feria de salud que hubo en Lorton. Ella muy gentilmente pues me informó del programa de NCCP para los niños y llevé los documentos que ella me solicitó y pues gracias a Dios fuimos aprobados rápidamente. Gracias a Dios, eh, Kaiser Permanente y el programa de NCCP cubrieron todos los gastos médicos de la operación de mi hija, doctores, enfermeras, nos trataron como, nos trataron especial, un trato especial y nos brindaron toda la ayuda necesaria. El CCP ha ayudado a mis hijos eh, varones con sus eh, examen físico, vacunas, se las pusieron al día y pues el cuidado de sus ojos que fue recomendado por la escuela y pues eh, el CCP ayudó con eso. La verdad que no hay palabras para describir lo que siento, lo agradecida que me siento. Devolverle la salud a un hijo es bien, bien importante. Sentirse, sentir la cobertura, sentirse apoyado, no uno solo. Cuando yo conocí el programa este de NCCP, la vida de mi familia cambió. Cambió la vida de mi hija. Hace dos años, Hace dos años, el 4 de julio, ella estaba y pues ella admiraba la piscina con sentimiento y no podía disfrutar. Y este año pues estamos ansiosos esperando el verano porque va a poder disfrutar como una niña, como un niño normal con salud. Cuando uno siente que todo está perdido y, y que nadie puede ayudarle, se entera y se da cuenta pues que hay gente buena, gente altruista, gente que tiene los recursos y que está ahí para ayudarle. Gracias Caice Permanente, gracias en CCP por ayudarnos y pensar en personas como nosotros. Gracias. <música>